Okay. Well, it's it's now a couple of uh, minutes past ten, um, so we'll we'll look to kick things off. So, welcome to day two of uh, National Apprenticeship Week 2022. Um, on behalf of uh, BPIF and BPIF training. Um, so there's a whole host of uh, events and workshops that we're running this week. So thanks uh, to those of you who attended the session yesterday and thanks to everyone for attending today's session right now. You've got the schedule for the rest of the week in front of you now. Uh, tomorrow we're going through a journey in print, which is uh, a session and employers and apprentices where you'll be able to get an insight on how print has changed through the generations and the value you can gain from the years of experience your mentors in the industry have. On Thursday, we've got a very popular session on apprenticeship recruitment and vacancies and where to start that process, how we can support you with that process. That's a session aimed at employers, parents, carers, guardians, students and teachers. And that's a session that's going to give you all the tools to ensure your apprenticeship vacancy attracts uh, well, the right individuals for the job role. Uh, and finally, on Friday, Carly's going to finish the week as she started with a, a wrap up of all the things that we've discussed over the past week. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up to any of these sessions just yet and you do have the time, please do so. You can book onto any of these events via the BPIF website on the events, events page, which is uh, around about the top right-hand side of that page. So without further ado, if I can get to my next slide, here we go. Today, we're going to be looking at apprenticeship funding and how that works and how to maximize the financial support that you have available to you. So this is uh, a session that's aimed at employers of all size, sizes, um, and we're gonna guide you through some of the funding opportunities available to your organization to support with your apprenticeship provision. Um, so if you're a large business, we're gonna look at how to utilize your apprenticeship levy. We're gonna discuss what the apprenticeship levy is, or if you're a small business and concerned about the cost of hiring an apprentice, uh, then we're gonna cover some of the opportunities that are available for you there as well. Um, so moving on, essentially there's three entry routes into uh, apprenticeship funding, depending on what type of a business you are. Um, so the three entry routes are uh, defined as an SME. So that's uh, those of you with a payroll under three million pounds per year. If you have less than 50 employees and you're hiring an apprentice, an apprentice aged 16 to 18, if that is the case, then you pay nothing, 0% uh, of the apprenticeship training costs and the government will subsidize the, the whole lot. Um, as with all apprentices, you can use that funding for existing staff as well as new apprentices. Um, and again, if that's the case, you'll be eligible for a £1,000 incentive payment for apprentices aged 16 to 18, or those who are 19 plus and require additional support. We're, we're going to look a bit more in detail at those various incentives uh, in a few slides time, so I won't go into that in great detail now. The second uh, gateway is for non-levy employers. So that's those of you with a payroll bill uh, under 3 million per year, uh, in which case you will contribute 5% of the cost of apprenticeship training and the government would top off the remaining 95% of that balance again. Uh, that's for new and existing staff. Uh, a lot of employers we hear from and work with um, assume that apprenticeships are for just those who are maybe 16 to 18, 19 to 24 maybe, and it's for new people entering the business. That's not the case. Absolutely anyone can sign up to an apprenticeship at, at any time. There is no uh, ceiling in terms of age. And again, for non-levy employers, those incentives are available to you as well. Finally, uh, levy paying employers. So that's the big businesses out there, the ones with a payroll bill over three million pounds per year. Um, you'll pay 0.5% of your annual payroll as a government apprenticeship levy 
And you also receive a £15,000 allowance. And in addition to that, the government will top up your contribution with an extra 10%. So for every £100 you put in, you pay towards that levy, the government will give you an extra tenner towards that. And obviously that, that adds up over time. And again, that's for new and existing staff. And again, you're still eligible for all of those incentive payments as well. So we've got three slightly different ways uh, of entering apprenticeship funding and we're going to go through those in a bit more detail now so i'm just going to let a couple of people in okay so how's that actually work in terms of the funding um so moving straight on from levy paying employers you will pay the levy automatically through your through your payroll systems to hmrc via your paye systems that money then goes uh, or can be viewed via your digital account. Again, in a few slides time, we'll look at how to access that information via the apprenticeship service. So you can actually uh, view your pot and see how much uh, income potential you've accumulated to spend on apprenticeship training. That's the point that the government will top up that funding by 10%. You can then, uh, hire your apprentice or start one of your existing staff on an apprenticeship they'll go through the process of receiving training uh, payments will be taken from your digital account and after 24 months funds will start to expire and again we'll go through that in a bit more detail in a few slides time a slightly different process for non-levy employers we miss out the first two stages and we go straight to uh, the training uh, to, to the staff receiving support from us or your training provider. Um, in this case, if you're a, an SME, you don't need to contribute the cost. If you're a non-levy employer, you'd or we'd ask for that 5% contribution, ideally up front, or for those who need a bit more support, we can uh, arrange all kinds of flexible payment schemes as well. This is also the point where uh, the government would uh, pay us or your training provider. As a training provider, we have a number of responsibilities that uh, we ourselves need to undertake. So we need to register with the SFA as a training provider. We need to be on the register of apprenticeship training providers, uh, which is a refresh that happens every couple of years. Um, looks to me as if the SFA have been attempting to reduce the number of training providers there are nationally um, and leave, I guess, the, the high quality ones remaining. Uh, so that we are also subject to things like Ofsted. So we, we need to maintain certain quality controls throughout that process as well. So once all that's done, we can then provide training to apprentices. Uh, we report outcomes to the SFA on a monthly basis through what we call an ILR. Um, and that's how we, we report all the activity that we've undertaken in, in previous months on a mi monthly basis. Um, and that's how one system talks to the apprenticeship service, which also talks to the uh, HMRC record service as well. Uh, so here's a sort of visual on how that works. You don't need to necessarily worry about this. You need to focus on, uh, on how your, your funding works as a, a levy or a non-levy individual employer. Okay, so one thing I get asked quite uh, a lot actually is, well, what happens to uh, to, to all this uh, levy uh, levy funding that's generated on a yearly basis? Do the government hoard it all? Do they hide it? Do they keep it? What do they spend it on? Um, so here's quite an interesting illustration I found. This is the most uh, recent illustration I could find. It goes back to the forecast for the 2019-2020 period. So things may have changed a little bit in that time, but we can see here from all the uh, the funds that are generated through the apprenticeship levy. So that's all the organisations uh, who are levy payers paying their 0.5% uh, of their payroll. That was then estimated to generate almost 3 billion over the 2019 to 2020 period. 
um, of which about 15% goes to the devolved administrations. So that's Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and those devolved administrations can decide how to fund and operate their, their apprenticeship programs, uh, however, however that way they want. The remaining balance of that uh, goes back into the training part. It goes back in towards apprenticeship and training and education. So an estimated 64% of that goes towards levy payers and non-levy payers uh, for existing learners. So that's maintaining funding for learners already on program. 22% uh, of that goes to levy payers for new starters. And the remaining 14% of that gets uh, transferred from levy payers to non-levy payers to fund non-levy, uh, I guess, government co-contributions as well. It would be interesting to see how things have moved on since 2019-20. So we'll, we'll look at out and uh, see if the government provide any information on, uh, on that at some point in the near future. But it's, it's quite an, it, an interesting illustration to share in any case. If you're still not sure, and we honestly don't know who is a, an apprentice an apprentice levy or non-levy payer. There is no list. We can't access that information. Uh, we can't ask for it from HR, HMRC. So we ask you the employers uh, for that information. So the best thing for you to do, if you're not quite sure, is to go onto the apprenticeship service uh, via the URL here, and we'll share all these links after the session. Um, and check it, check it out yourself, get yourself configured properly. And from there, you can view your levy pot if you have one, or it'll link to HMRC and it will tell you that you are indeed not uh, a levy employer. There's a few other things you can do there. So you can get an estimate on your apprenticeship funding, which allows employers to calculate whether they'll pay the apprenticeship levy or not and how much they'll have available to spend on apprenticeships. So it's a really good starting point uh, to get logged on and registered here. It'll also show uh, employers how much the government will contribute towards the cost of training. Uh, there's a number of other services you can access from the apprenticeship service and actually the SFA have been quite good on expanding the number of services here. So you can use that uh, service there, the apprenticeship service, essentially it's your central hub. It'll direct you where you need to go for apprenticeship training. Uh, so you can find apprenticeship training. So if you've got an idea of what standards you want to deliver, you can go on there and it will give you as an employer and easy to digest information on the choices you have available to you and you can easily search for and find a standard framework and training provider compare comparing one other providers with each other um, I think it also gives you feedback um, from surveys on providers so you can see them almost through a review system you can also look at recruiting apprentices through that platform so you can post vacancies we can help you with that certainly we're going to be looking uh, at that more closely on Thursday so I won't mention that too much and finally you can use the managing uh, manage apprenticeship service which allows registered levy levy paying employers to view their account balance manage their apprentices and approve funds to pay for apprenticeship training so th this is your your central hub really this is the place to go to to manage all your funds your apprenticeships your relationships with training providers your vacancies everything really this this is the website that's absolutely critical to uh, to managing the, the process and flow okay so on to incentive payments and the kind of funding you can access so these uh the legacy i guess incentives these have been around since uh, the apprenticeship reforms were introduced in way back in may 2017 i think um, so there's a number of uh of incentives you can access now and at any point so the government will pay uh for 16 to 18 year olds 1000 pounds to employers and a further 1000 to training providers if they train a 16 to 18 year old apprentice so that's any 16 to 18 year old apprentice you take on you will get that uh, that subsidy there there's also uh, a similar incentive for disadvantaged young people um, so, so again that's a thousand pounds to employers a thousand pounds to providers if they train 19 to 24 year olds leaving care uh, or who have a local authority education and health care plan and finally, for small employers, um, those with fewer than 50 employees, 
So you get 100% of the training cost covered and assessment costs. And you'll also be able to access the two incentives I've mentioned above. And again, there's a useful link at the bottom of that page for accessing uh, all of that information in a lot more detail. And again, we'll share those slides and links with you. Um, there's been a couple of additional incentive payments which were uh, introduced in the last year. And these have been extended a few times in the past. So I do recommend that you keep checking out and looking for updates on these incentives. We're hoping. Uh, that there may be a further extension of this. But for now, and this is time critical, so if you have employed uh, anyone, so any member of staff, if you are any new staff who started between the 1st of October 2021 to 31st of January 2022, potentially you could uh, apply for a payment of £3,000 for each one of those apprentices that you take on. So there is a, an eligibility criteria there for that. So you can apply for apprentices with an employment start date between 1st of October to 31st of January. So that, that uh, obviously that's happened now, that's in the past, but you may want to go back and review any starters you've had during that period. Um, they can still start an apprenticeship now and be eligible to access that incentive payment provided now that they start their uh, apprenticeship by the 31st of March 2022. As an employer, you'll need to make this application and that's done through the apprenticeship service online. It's not something that we as a provider manage. That's something uh, that you need to make an application for, but there's loads of guidance uh, for that available online. And of course, we're more than happy to, to help you out with that. Uh, in terms of what you can spend all of these incentives on, it's really down to, to you guys. It's down to employers what you use that money for. Um, so it's totally different to levy funds. You can spend it on anything to support your organization's costs. So it could be uniforms your apprentices travel, it could be towards their salary, uh, it could be abs for absolutely anything you like at all, and you do not have to pay it back. And that's that £3,000 incentive here is in addition to the existing £1,000 an employer will already get for taking on an apprentice who's 16 to 18 or otherwise eligible. Okay, so moving on to national insurance contributions um now this is something actually i don't think as many employers or people we work with are aware of but it's um it's definitely something that helps out a little bit so ever since april 2016s employers haven't been required to pay uh the class one national insurance contributions for an apprentice if the apprentice is under 25 year old under 25 years old and is on an approved UK government apprenticeship standard or framework and earns less than £967 a week or £50,000 a year. If you do know any apprentices under 25 who are earning more than £50,000 a year, then please uh, direct me to that career. Okay, and again, another useful link at the bottom here or do contact us if you need any support going through through that okay this is quite a useful slide in terms of um things again maybe employers didn't know or hadn't heard before so i'll, I'll cover this now top seven myths about the apprenticeship program so number one as my levy funds expire after 24 months then i cannot use them to fund all of an apprenticeship that lasts longer than 24 months that's uh, not quite true um, the fact that your funds expire after 24 months in your apprenticeship service account doesn't stop you meeting the full cost of an apprenticeship that lasts longer than 24 months. New funds enter your account every month as long as you pay the levy. Um, and again, only, only funds that are not spent with it will expire 24 months after they enter your account. And of course, you can use the apprenticeship service to monitor all of that funding as well. Uh, Number two, if you don't spend all your levy, it gets spent by central government on other things. Well, we saw that a few slides ago. 
And actually what we're told is that unspent levy funds get reallocated to other apprentices within financial years. So that, that money is ring-fenced and put back in towards apprenticeship and that education and training. Okay, I won't get into too much detail with uh, a few of these other points, but as a few of them uh, relate to apprenticeship funding, I thought they'd be quite useful and interesting for you guys to see. Um, so quickly here on a 20% off the training, um, so it isn't inflexible. It doesn't have to be one day a week. We can we can move that round. We can uh, deliver all of it at the beginning, at the middle, or at the end of the apprenticeship. Okay. Number four, providers have to advise apprenticeship vacancies for us. Um, not true. You can do that yourselves. Uh, number five, and this is a big one: apprenticeships cannot be used for existing staff. Absolutely, they can do. So apprenticeships can be used to upskill and or retrain employees of any age, including older workers or existing staff, as long as the apprenticeship is giving them new skills to enable them to achieve competence in their chosen occupation. So yeah, once again, apprenticeships are open to absolutely anyone in your organization, provided the apprenticeship uh, that they sign up to does indeed train them with new skills, uh, knowledge and behaviours and apprenticeships not for somebody who simply wants accreditation. If you want a certificate for something you already know, not necessarily for you. There's other things you can look at there. OK, number six, apprenticeships are only entry level. They are for low skill people. Absolutely not true. Again, uh, we deliver all the way up to a level seven senior leader apprenticeship and they're available from level two, which is GCFC equivalent, right through to level six and seven, which is equivalent to a bachelor's or a master's degree. Okay. And again, number seven apprenticeships are only for young people. Well, we know they're not, and we've mentioned that now. Um, so moving on, how much does it actually cost? So these are the apprenticeship standards that we deliver starting with the print technician level three. So the cost you see here is representative of the maximum funding band cost, um, which means that's the maximum amount uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll receive as a, a training provider and will potentially come from your levy account. Or if indeed, if you're a non-levy payer, you'd contribute uh, 600 pounds of that, which is 5% of the 12 thousand pounds potentially that maximum cost there so for print technician the maximum there is twelve thousand pounds however we do undertake a thorough and robust initial assessment of all our apprentices uh, when they start on program so if at that stage we determine that actually it's not going to take the full duration for you to uh to complete this apprenticeship it's not going to take the 30 months or maybe you do have a lot of prior knowledge and skills in certain areas potentially we could look at reducing that cost and that duration um, which means if you're a levy payer let's say we reduce that to eleven thousand or ten thousand that's what uh, would come out of your levy pot and that would affect the five percent contribution as well so these are the apprenticeships that we BPIF training deliver, the print technician level three at 12,000, the print operative more recently introduced level two at 8,000, team leader level three, the operations or departmental manager level five, senior leader, which is new to us. We're starting a new cohort of that relatively soon. So if you are interested in any of these qualifications or these apprenticeships, please do get in touch and we can support you into signing up. Uh, we also deliver the customer service practitioner level two, the customer service specialist level three, business admin level three, the lean manufacturing operative level two, more recently the signage technician, which actually we've had quite a lot of interest in. And finally, and again, a new uh, course there that we started to deliver the sales executive level four. So that, that's how the funding works. And those are the maximum costs. Uh, another thing you might be interested in doing, and not everyone's necessarily aware of this, is that you can transfer unused apprenticeship funds to other employers. So employers who pay the apprenticeship levy and have unused apprenticeship funds can find employers who want to receive a transfer. Um, so you could look at maybe employers you work with. Uh, you could get in touch with other employers in your industry. You could work with regional partners. 
this is something that's really useful, we think, in terms of maybe supporting your supply chain or maybe just putting something uh, back into the sector. So you might you might know of other organizations that need a bit of this support. So where we see uh, ourselves as uh, perhaps being able to support and facilitate some of this, um, if you are a levy payer and you've got loads of money left in your account and you know it's not going to get spent, so uh, it's going to expire after those 24 months, please get in touch with us and we can redirect some of that uh, apprenticeship levy funding towards an employer within the sector who does need it. Okay, and then we can support the industry as a whole, which is something that's really, really valuable, uh, certainly in the current economic climate, I think. Uh, so you can transfer up to a maximum of 25% of your annual funds. So that's an increase on previous years. And you can make transfers from the apprenticeship account to as many employers as you choose. Okay, so what transfers can pay for? Well, they can pay for apprenticeship training and nothing else. So you can't move funds around to, say, a member of your supply chain and then use it for something else. It's ring, ring fenced running fenced to apprenticeship training. So it's used to pay for the training and assessment costs of the apprenticeship agreed with the receiving employer. And that's all managed through the apprenticeship service. There's a link at the bottom of this page here. And again, we'll share all those links with you guys, but there's loads of uh, instructional videos and diagrams and links and step-by-step -step guides. There's loads of information out there. And again, we're more than happy to help and support with that. Um, sending and receiving employees do need to know that. Funds are paid monthly for the duration of the apprenticeship. So you want to make sure you've got enough at the start to, to go all the way to the end. Uh, only levy, levy, employing, levy paying employers can make a transfer. Any employer can receive and use transfer funds. So it could even be levy to levy. And sending and receiving employers have to be registered on the apprenticeship service. A transfer can only be used to pay for training and assessment for apprenticeship standards. So not the old frameworks. And transfers can only be used for new starts. So if you've already got an apprenticeship on program, you cannot be the recipient of transferred funds to uh, put towards cost of an existing apprenticeship. But something that's really, really useful uh, and good to know, I think, and for maybe some of the SMEs and smaller non-levy payers, you may know, or may you may have a contact uh, with someone who works with a larger levy paying employer. Maybe now, maybe now's a good time to get in touch with them and see how, how they can support. Uh, or if you don't know anyone, please come to us and we'll see if we can maybe facilitate something. Okay, so a quick illustration on how that might work. Uh, so the sending employer would calculate the available spend and again, you can access and view what you've got in your pot via the apprenticeship service. Both employers would then discuss and agree terms offline, or we could be the link in between there, the intermediary. The receiving employer would set up an apprenticeship service account online. The sending employer would initiate a connection online using the account ID from the receiving employer. So you sounds a bit more complicated than it is in practice. So the apprenticeship service is quite intuitive in, in how it's used, but it, it's about sharing num numbers online. Okay. The receiving employer then chooses a training provider and you can both add and approve the apprentices online. Uh, finally, the sending employer can give final approval of cost and the standards and the apprenticeship can start and payments start to be made on a monthly basis. Okay, another useful fact sheet here, I think, uh, with some useful things about uh, maybe some wrong assumptions about uh, apprenticeship heavy transfer. So number one, you can only make a transfer of apprenticeship service funds to an employer in your supp supply chain. Not true, you can do it to anyone. Uh, secondly, you can fund any apprenticeship with a transfer. We've mentioned this, it's just for the new standards, but no, nobody's delivering frameworks anymore, so that shouldn't pose an issue. Thirdly, if an employer makes a transfer to another employer, then they won't know what they will spend it on. Absolutely not true. You'll know exactly uh, where that money's going. You'll know what apprenticeship standard uh, it's going towards. Uh, can I transfer 10% of my apprenticeship service funds to charity as a gift? No, no, you can't. It, it can only go towards uh, apprenticeship training. Uh, number five, training providers can transfer apprenticeship service funds and deliver the, the training. 
not necessarily training providers can make transfers, but they cannot then provide the training for that funding, either as the provider or as a subcontractor. Number six, you can only fund one apprentice at a time with the transfer and you can only make one transfer transaction. Uh, not true. So you, as a temporary measure, when transfers were first introduced, you were only able to make one. That's not the case now. You can transfer to any number of employers for any number of apprenticeships with each up to the maximum of, uh, I think this is an old side, it says 10% of your allowance here, but actually that's 25% now. Okay. Something we do get asked a lot, which does happen more often than you think, actually. So for uh, organizations that are maybe just sort of on the threshold of that three million um, pound levy uh, threshold. So where there are insufficient funds in the employer's levy account, and the, then the employer would be required to co-invest. So at that point, if you run out of apprenticeship funds in your levy account, essentially you, you become a non-levy employer. So what happens at that stage is uh, whatever the balance remaining there is, um, you'd be asked to pay a 5% co-investment towards that and the government would subsidize the remaining 95% balance. Uh, that's for any any apprenticeship starts after 1st of April 2019. Uh, before that, you'd have been asked to make a 10% co-investment payment. So we, as a training provider, would tell you that we get various reports from the ESFA, our funders, that tell us um, when uh, an employer's uh, levy is running a bit low. And actually, let's say in that month, they haven't had enough they haven't had enough in there to cover the training for their apprenticeship so at that point we'd open a, a dialogue with an employer and potentially we'd uh, we'd invoice them for that five percent difference okay so yeah we, we'd invoice you there so the, the employer's requirement to co-invest where they have insufficient funds in their levy account is also included in your contract with the sfa and the provider funding rules uh, require the training provider to collect that co-investment payment. So in other words, we've already signed up and agreed to that process at the beginning. Um, and actually, if you think about it, if your funds are running a bit low, you're, you're not being asked to, to fund 100% uh, of that, that balance subsidy, it's just a 5% uh, contribution or co-contribution. So it, it's, it's unless you've got loads and loads and loads of apprentices and suddenly you've run out of levy funds uh, maybe because your payroll's drastically reduced it's unlikely to be a huge amount you're looking at okay moving on to traineeships and potentially how we can use that uh, collaboratively with uh, apprenticeships to get a really sort of cost efficient and effective way of taking staff on board and supporting uh, young people throughout their the early stages of their employment. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, a traineeship is a skills development program that includes a work experience placement aimed at helping to prepare young people aged 16 to 18 for employment or an apprenticeship. Uh, traineeships uh, will include between 70 and 240 hours work experience placement with uh, BPIF or your training provider providing support for additional training needs for the young person. Um, how the traineeship program works. So what would happen early on? We'd assess the needs of the trainee once they come on program. Um, some trainees may need pre-employment training before starting their work experience placement. So we could either do a pre-employment program and then put an individual into a placement or we could run things side by side. We do then work with the employer to plan and agree the length of the work experience placement, uh, the days the trainee works and how the program will be delivered. So traineeships, I think, represent quite a, a flexible way of delivering uh, pre-employment programs and employers can change the program as they go to make sure that the trainee gets the most out of it. After the traineeship itself, um, what we really want employers to do is to offer the trainee an apprenticeship or at least an exit interview or a uh, even better full, full time employment. So, how does that link up? What are the benefits? Um, well, offering a work placement gives employers a really, really good chance to get to know and work with a young person, see if they're right for an apprenticeship, 
or a job in their business, to design a program that suits the needs of the trainee in their business, to develop current employees' experience in training and mentoring, uh, maybe to recruit new talent for your business. And also you get to claim an employer incentive of £1,000 when a work experience placement of over 70 hours has been completed. Um, so you can claim that £1,000 up to a maximum of 10 trainees. Um, and that's once the 70 hours have been completed. Uh, so traineeships are funded by the government. There's no cost towards employers here at all. Um, they're free to the employer. But of course, um, you may choose to support trainees with expenses such as transport and meals. And we really, really encourage you to do so as, as we understand this, this isn't uh, a paid placement. Uh, okay, some of you may be thinking, well, that's not too different from Kickstart. What, what is the difference? Why, why would we go onto a traineeship when we, when we have Kickstart? Well, for one, the Kickstart seem um, applications closed for that on uh, at midday on the 17th of December. Um, so for those of you who were involved in that or are involved in that, uh, there's a deadline now. I think last time I looked that the young person must be in, job, in work before the 31st of March uh, and you'd have already had your vacancy uploaded and approved. Okay, so they are quite similar programs. Otherwise, if we look at the target audience for traineeships, uh, and Kickstart, they're both looking at 16 to 24 year olds, um, similar kind of demographics, one for those with a level three or below education, Kickstart for those on universal credit. Traineeships on average last uh, eight to 12 weeks, you can run them for a much longer period of time, although I wouldn't suggest doing so given that it is an unpaid placement. Uh, Kickstart is a paid placement uh, for six months. Minimum hours for a tra traineeship, 70 hours, kickstart 25 hours per week. Incentives, I've mentioned for traineeships, you can get £1,000 per trainee up to 10 per employee. Salaries, traineeships are unpaid. Kickstarts have their wage contributions subsidized by the government. Uh, provider support, kickstart them. Um, traineeships directly managed and delivered by a training provider. So really what we're saying is for tra traineeships, we really, really, really see it as a, a sort of pre-employment or pre-apprenticeship program where we work a lot with a young person to support them. So by the time they are, are in employment, they're job ready that they've had. They've been through uh, a fair amount of training with us. They've, they've been through the basics. They know about uh, things like the, the importance of turning up on time and smartly dressed or, or whatever and of course there's some of the vocational training and aspects that we offer on, on top of that uh, but really it, it's something we need to see a progression at the end of yeah we want to see a, a trainee finishing with a job an apprenticeship or at least a, an exit interview so an example of how this might look in practice um, so say for an example we have a 17 year old trainee starts uh, and they, they start with a a program with BPIF training. We'd offer a program that incorporates employability skills, uh, English and maths, so that's functional skills for those who don't already have a level two or equivalent English and maths qualification. And then the traineeship also has what we call the flexible um, component, which could include vocational training, qualifications. Uh, it could also include things like job, job search support, careers guidance and things like that but but we know we we'd be working towards um say jobs within the print sector so that's what the pre uh, pre-employment support program would be geared towards so we'd have you know things focused towards whatever if they're going towards an administration role we'd focus more on that uh, if they're going into say the print shop floor we'd focus on that so Ideally, after that, they'd move into the work placement. We could actually also work, um, the, the work placement could also be run alongside the three programs for, or it can happen after. And after those 70 hours of the work placement has been completed, the employer can claim that incentive of £1,000 up to a maximum of 10 trainees. Um, what we'd like to see then is the trainee then progressing onto an apprenticeship. And again, 
that might trigger another incentive payment there. We, we've talked about already about how the funding for an apprenticeship works. If you timed this right, of course, you could have had an, a traineeship with a thousand pound incentives there then who started work um, or even from the kickstart program between the, the, the windows we mentioned earlier you'd have triggered the three thousand pounds payment and then you could have got the one thousand uh, pound payment then as well so there's an example there of a, a traineeship um, i guess pathway into an apprenticeship program so sorry i've absolutely rushed through that and I've talked non-stop uh, for the past 40 minutes so I don't know if there's any questions let me open up the little dialogue or I'm more than happy to open to the floor I don't know if anyone everyone's muted or everyone has questions so I've got a couple of questions here morning can we transfer a kickstarter onto an apprenticeship from Susan Tyrrell uh, yes absolutely you can that's definitely something we can help you out with I think Carly's responded actually do we receive rep recording? Yep, recordings are going to be made available online and shared. And we will share the presentation slides as well. So I know I've absolutely flown through that. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Or if you do want to pick, pick this up with me separately, my details are available on the screen as well. So do send me an email or do give me a call. Oh, I can see. Is that Lee, Lee Sargent? I think you're muted. It looks like you want to ask me something. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of information there. So not, can I just check that where the apprenticeship differs to the Kickstarter? The Kickstarter pays wages up to X percent, 9,500 percent in some cases, but the apprenticeship pays for training only and, and any salary would be covered by the employer. Correct. Yeah, so the, the Kickstarter... The Kickstart program covers, uh, it's, it's a subsidy, isn't it, towards 25 hours salary. Uh, you can top that off, I think, as well. And then if you progressed onto an apprenticeship at the end of that Kickstart program, then the employer would need to, to cover the cost of salary and payroll themselves. And then as a, a levy employer, the money would have come out their pot for the training, or as a non-levy employer, they'd need to contribute 5% towards that cost of training does that make sense lee or it does yes yeah okay and do give me a shout afterwards uh or drop me an email if you want to have a, a, a conversation and basically the the those list of sort of numbers like level one to, to seven they're, they're all the apprenticeships available via the bpif so that's the exhaustive list is it that's correct yeah and we're we're, we're looking always uh to expand on that and we we've you know, in the last year, we've added quite a few more different uh, standards uh, to our curriculum. Um, and I think if there is a demand out there, if, if we do get a lot of feedback from the sector, we're always willing to, to go back and review. So if you do have requirements beyond the standards that are listed there, uh, do speak to me or anyone else at the at BPIF, BPIF training, and we'll see if we can facilitate that as well. Essentially, I think we're, we're the demand led in terms of the apprenticeships that we look to deliver so things like the signage technician is something that we were asked by a number of uh, employers to look at and, and we've done so as a result of that you don't do, do you have a pool of people already is, is that where we, we put an ad but our people apply it and then it gets put onto you sort of thing. yeah so that that's something that we've really worked uh, a lot towards in but the last few months actually so we've we've really started traditionally i think in previous years we worked um mostly with existing employers uh, existing staff and employers more recently we've uh, been posting a huge amount of uh, vacancies um, you can see the list of vacancies online at the bpf training website if you want to get an idea of the kind of roles that we're we're supporting with but um yeah absolutely we've got um we're, we've got a slowly growing pool of uh, of talent and obviously things like the traineeship program allow us if uh, if an employer wants to host an individual for that program it allows us to have to access funding to widen our pool and create that talent pool of individuals that we can maybe support into uh, into employment across uh, across our membership network mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So th thank you all for uh, sitting through that. I saw a number of you did uh, enter the session a bit later, so we, we will share all the slides and we'll share the, the video recording of this as well. But again, please do go online, do check out our website, look at those vacancies if you want a, an idea of the courses we offer, of the vacancies we can support with. Uh, do go to the BritishPrint.com website and do book onto the events uh, for the rest of the week. We've got some really, really interesting and useful sessions coming up that actually I think you'll, you'll get quite a lot out of. Here are those events. Uh, I'll cover this a, a bit at the beginning of the session as well but please do go online and uh, and book onto these sessions um and uh, yeah if there's anything that doesn't come out of these sessions please please do get in touch as well and we'll support you in any way we can <laughs>